So let's talk about refining and sort of, uh, I'm sure you've heard a lot of these terms here. I want to just define what they are. And a lot of these terms um, and procedures are really built for industry, you know, for very, very large operations. Big challenge for us was uh, scaling these down to something that could be done on, on a farm on a very small scale. Um, but when we think about oil refining, we think about places like this, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it's pretty similar to petrochemical refining, oil refining, you know, combustible oil refining. Uh, it just happens to be edible, what we're dealing with. Um, but some of those processes are amenable to small, you know, a small scale. Okay, we'll talk about those. Um, again, why do we refine? We care about refining because we care about removing this other stuff here, this 1% of stuff. Okay, that's the conventional wisdom. You've got to get rid of that stuff because it's the thing that, it's the fraction of that pie that makes the oil smell and taste and go rancid, stuff like that. Um, so in canola, typically, okay, and this is pretty much true of all oil seeds, I'd say, you've got these two sort of competing factors, these antioxidants, things like tocopherol, the vitamin E, which is really the plant's own, you know, native antioxidant system. That's how it pre prevents uh, oxidation in vivo, you know. Um, that stuff can be retained in processing if you let it, uh, if you don't remove it. Um, and there's some pigment too, specifically uh, the carotenoids. Uh, um, the color of the, these unrefined oils really is from these pigments often. Um, that can either be yellow or red or uh, orange, okay. Um, Lutein is an example. Lycopene, you've heard of this. This is the pigment in tomato. Um, they're pigmented, that's true, but uh, they're also pretty good antioxidants. And if you keep them in there, they can protect your oil. Um, but not all pigments are antioxidants. There's actually uh, a very strong pro-oxidative pigment, and that's chlorophyll, which you guys know about, um, the, the green in plant material. And that is a pretty good pro-oxidant. Okay. Um, and some other things too, um, namely the water that comes in into play here. And you wouldn't think of your oil having water, but there's actually some water in it. Not a lot, and not even enough to really see, but there is water. Um, and here's what it really looks like in your oil. You know, it's not this homogenous system at all. It really is an emulsion, a very specific kind of emulsion. Uh, we've got tiny little pools, reservoirs of water that are there, sort of floating around, um, and they're stabilized by material that is, well, it's surface active material, sort of a surfactant, um, that type of stuff that, that promotes the, uh, the formation of these little pools, okay? And it's really where these, these pools are where oxidation happens in a fat, okay, uh, on the outside here, okay? Um, the water solubilizes the metals, the water solubilizes um, other catalysts for oxidation. So the water is not a pro-oxidant itself, but it enables oxidation to happen. It's sort of the enab uh, enabler of the system here. Um, so this is actually what it looks like under a microgram. Uh, you can see these little dots here. Um, the, so what's really important is removing these little surfactant things. Well, you can try to get rid of the water too, but it's probably more effective to try to get rid of these things that stabilize the water droplets to begin with. Um, and that's what a lot of refining is about. Okay. Um, so these are the sort of big categories of, of oil refining. Um, we recognize all these terms here. Okay. Uh, neutralization um, really refers to getting rid of those free fatty acids. You know? So when you've got a triglyceride that's been pulled apart enzymatically, you're left with these things that taste kind of soapy. You can get them out of your solution, uh, out of your oil by adding, um, um, by adding a, a weak caustic solution. You're actually adding sodium hydroxide. You're essentially making soap. This is how soap is made, really. So you're adding a strong base to this acid, it neutralizes, this thing comes out of solution, it's not soluble, okay? Um, I don't know of anyone doing this on a small scale. Do you guys know? You're talking, you know, never, you know, we could look into it, but... Um, Using caustic in redundancy, but not... 
Yeah, I think the better approach is prevention, really. You know, I think you don't want to get into this, really. Um, and, but this is, you know, if you, if you run into this term, that's what this refers to, neutralization. So often a, a technique that, or a bit of analysis that people do is titratable acidity, measuring the acid level of an oil. And that refers to this. This is an acid. It reacts to a titration analysis. Okay. Um, so you've got a lot of this here. You'll get a high reading. And you know, if you're Cargill, you're going to add a 12% caustic to get rid of that stuff. Okay. Uh, Degumming is something that some people have tried in this room uh, on a small scale. And it's basically a step to get rid of these phospholipids. Um, these are also lipids, but they're not triglycerides. These are more surface active compounds that can stabilize these little reservoirs, these little droplets. Okay, so they're a problem. From that perspective, from an oxidation perspective, they're a problem in fuels. Um, they're a problem in terms of uh, consumer acceptability appearance. You get these sludgy gums. You can see at the bottom of this. You guys have all seen this. It's not all phospholipid, but um, phospholipid really contributes to that that gum, that sort of sludgy stuff. Um, so you can get rid of those a um, couple different ways. Often just a weak acid solution instead of deviation. Um, seems like it'd be a pain on a small scale. Uh, I'm not sure if it's, if you found that to be true. That's awkward, but um, we haven't played around with this either. Um, but um, what we have played around with is, is bleaching. Um, and bleaching is pretty indiscriminate. Um, it's a way of removing a lot of things that can cause oxidation problems in general, um, including some phospholipids. Some uh, phospholipids can be pulled out of solution by, by bleaching clays. Okay, so this is essentially what we're talking about. It's a clay, a little diatoms here, um, that attract things in the oil that are not triglycerides, you know, non-oil compounds. Um, so this is a really good thing for removing pigment, from, for removing color. And that's why these are called bleaching clays. right? Um, but they also can pull out some phospholipid. I think we've got confirmation of that. Uh, it might be sort of a poor man's approach to, um, to degumming. We don't know yet. Um, unfortunately, or depending on your perspective, fortunately, we can also strip out aroma and flavor with bleaching as well. So a lot of these compounds that are flavor active that make the oil smell and taste kind of nice, they get stripped out by this stuff. So if you took an extra virgin olive oil, it smells sort of uh, you know, grassy and green and sort of spicy and peppery, you put that through bleaching clay and that would all go, go away. Uh, so for that kind of product, you don't want that. For flax oil, maybe you, you do want that or other products. So it depends on your perspective, what you're trying to do. Um, but um, it is a pretty easy process. Um, we've demonstrated, or at least Doug's demonstrated, that it can be um, suited to a small on-farm process. Um, there's some tricks to it, I think, we've seen. Um, but uh, bleaching is pretty common. All right, so skipping bleaching. Um, this is, again, a decision that you'll have to make and a decision really that depends on what you're trying to do. I think um, if you're making oil that's going to eventually go into a biofuel, maybe you don't care about the subtlety of the aroma of the canola. Maybe you just, that's, that's OK. Um, but if you're trying to make an oil that you're going to market as an unrefined, natural, um, you know, aromatic oil, probably you can skip it. Okay. And the conventional wisdom is that you're you know, really playing with fire here because the stability of this product is going to be very low. Um, a lot of this bleaching is done to prevent oxidation problems. Uh, we found that that's not really the case, at least with the oils that we've tested. And there are some workarounds, too. Um, let me just skip a couple of slides here. Um, so this is, I think I showed this last year, too. This, this guy. This Canadian guy sells unrefined, totally unrefined canola um, up in Canada for a lot of money per gallon, about 100 bucks a gallon. But if you look, look at what he's selling, look at the packaging here, right, what do you notice, first of all? Dark bottle. Dark bottle. Okay, that's good, right? They put you in a box. 
It's, it's also going to be in a box, right? What about, the, what about the size of these? Small, okay, so you use them up pretty quick. And big ass label. And if I had to guess too, he's probably uh, packaging with inert gas on top in the headspace of that bottle, which you, you often see with brewing and, and winemaking and a lot of other foods too. Um, so there's things you can do other than refining, other than adding antioxidants and chelators. Okay. And, um, you know, I, I don't know, maybe oxidation is a problem analytically, but is it a problem in terms of consumer acceptability? Does the consumer actually care about it? Or can they taste it over all the other canola flavors there? It's a, it's a question, you know, that we don't know. Um, so that's, let me skip back here. Um, I, I skip two things here. Deodorization, um, I think, is something that you probably don't want to get into. But if you see the term, this is what it refers to. It's just stripping off uh, under vacuum, usually, um, or reduced pressure, the aroma compounds in your oil. Okay, so um, it's actually done on a commercial setting to get rid of these rancid notes. So these little chunks of the oil that get spit off during oxidation. Uh, a place like Cargill is going to just strip off these things by, by vacuum. Okay, so it's kind of a, uh, it's like a band-aid. Um, winterization is, is often done too with, um, uh, with canola, I think, but um, for sure with um, most oil seeds, uh, soy oil, soybean oil for sure. Um, it's a pretty simple process. You just take the oil, oil and you lower the temperature and make it really cold and that forces all the saturated fatty acids to crystallize, to turn to a fat from an oil, and to drop out of solution. And then what's on the top here is the unsaturated stuff. You pump this thing off, this stuff goes to soap or whatever else. Um, and um, the point is that this doesn't happen in the consumer's refrigerator. It happens in the plant where you can control it and then deal with it. Uh, but winterization means that. and. Um, I think you don't need to really worry about that, with canola at least. Um, we've tried to winterize at least the canola that we've made here, or made down at Penn State, um, and we couldn't throw crystals like this to any degree. Um, so, but if you see that, that's what that means. So, you know, the, the whole, you get, get a whole sort of spectrum of products here, depending on how much refining you want to put into a, a product. Um, we know this, and consumers know this from olive oil. Okay, you've got a spectrum of products. Um, you know, what's this? Extra virgin, okay, so that's the, that's unrefined essentially, filtered a bit, um, but left as is. And then on this side, you've got something that could be called pomace oil or pure olive oil, which is really a hexane extracted product. Um, and everything in between here too. So you don't really see this for any other products or oil products that I know of. Um, but, you know, maybe someday. Um, an issue, though, is when you try to take these oils that are unbleached and unrefined um, and you try to put them into a food product and you try to make something out of it. Uh, this is a salad dressing that we made according to the standard of identity of the government. So there's a standard in how salad dressings are made in this country. We did this according to that procedure and this is what we got, something that looks pretty yellow, um, which is fine. I think it looks kind of nice, really. But um, that, that color that you're introducing by not using a refined oil, um, and maybe it's not always suitable. Maybe you don't want that. It depends. 